welcome, welcome. I am so delighted to have you here with us. It is Shiloh Sophia, the curator here at the Intentional Creativity Museum. And we are here to launch season three of Power Creative TV, y'all. Like season three, and it's Muse and Maverick themed because we want to get into a little bit of dangerous territory as we explore the thoughts and ideas of innovative edge walkers and thinkers that are stirring us to think thoughts we haven't had for a while or thought for some time. Now, as you will likely remember, we've had two previous episodes of Power Creatives TV and took a break because of you know what, but here we are. And I can't think of a more perfect person to start this series with than Mitch Horowitz. Now, if you are familiar with his work, then you know that you are delighted to be here. And if you are not familiar with his work, this is gonna be a real treat. Mitch is a new teacher for me. Uh, Jonathan and I actually were saved, served a Facebook ad for once they got it right. And it was a talk that Mitch gave and we listened to it and we're like, wow, cool interesting that's different let's play that again okay that's interesting oh wow oh and so we started just paying attention and following along a little bit more and studying some of mitch's work and uh we discovered there were some thoughts there who that felt like it was time to hear and so the thought of bringing mitch to you and to those of us who are studying in the maverick community was really exciting for us so i just want to Welcome, Mitch, and all of you. So all of you, welcome, welcome to Power Creatives TV. And I'm going to introduce Mitch, and then you're going to get to see his, his face. And our topic today is a topic that's near and dear to both my heart and the work of Mitch, which is the mind as a causative agent of change. The mind as a causative agent of change. So just let that sink in for a moment. Most of you are creatives and are conscious catalysts. So you, you know the mind is a causative agent of change. But today we're going to invite you to consider some new ways of working with that, including exploring the power of a wish. So I invite you to just settle in. If you have your cup of tea, I have my Intentional Creativity Museum mug and so if you have your tea and just settle in and it's like story time, you're exactly in the right place. There's nothing else you need to do but be here. And I'm going to read to us about Mitch. Mitch Horowitz is a historian of alternative spirituality and one of today's most literate voices of esoterica, mysticism, and the occult. Mitch illuminates outsider history, explains its relevance to contemporary life, and reveals the long-standing quest to bring empowerment and agency to the human condition. He is widely credited with returning the term, quote, new age to respectable use and is among the few occult writers whose work touches the bases of academic scholarship, national journalism, and subculture cred. Mitch, I don't know what that is. You're gonna to have to tell me about that. Mitch is a writer in residence in the New York Public Library, lecturer in residence at the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles, and the Penn award-winning author of books, including Occult America, One Simple Idea, How Positive Thinking Reshaped Modern Life, The Miracle Club, Miracle Habits, and the forthcoming Daydream Believer being released this summer. He has discussed alternative spirituality on CBS Sunday Morning, Dateline NBC, Vox, Netflix, Explained, Vice News, Keisha and the Creepies, AMC Shutter's Cursed Films, an official selection of XXSW. Mitch hosted and produced a feature documentary about the occult classic, The Caballion, directed by Emmy nominee Ronnie Thomas and shot on location in Egypt. It was very trippy and very cool. The movie premiered as the number three top documentary on iTunes in 2022. Mitch has written on everything from the war on witches to the checkered career of professional skeptic James Randi for the New York Times, Boing Boing, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Time Politico, and a wide range of zines and scholarly journals. 
Mitch's books have appeared in Arabic, Chinese, Italian, Spanish, Korean, and Portuguese. He worked for many years in publishing, including as a vice president at Penguin Random House and was editor in chief of Tartar Penguin, an imprint dedicated to metaphysical topics. His book, Awakened Mind, is one of the first works of new thought translated and published in Arabic. He received the Walden Award for Interfaith Intercultural Understanding and the Chinese government has censored this work. So I love reading that. It's like, it's a credentials or it's a rap sheet. I mean, it's some, <laughs> some kind of a welcome, Mitch, to the Intentional Creativity Museum. Welcome. Thank you so much. Great to be here. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, great. Oh my gosh. Well, it's great to hang out with you again. For those of you who don't know, Mitch and I have been having some pretty fascinating conversations about the intersection of... Um, of intentional creativity and causative thinking. So Mitch, for those who are new to your work, what would you like us to know about what matters the most to you at this point in your journey? Wow, um, it's wonderful to be confronted with that question. I suppose <laughs> what matters to me most at this point in my journey is writing about metaphysical experience and history with total integrity. I try to be really transparent about my own search I have wonderful experiences, I have failures, and I don't think that on the spiritual path we should be afraid of words like success or failure or feel that they always have to be qualified or rearranged. I think that the seeking individual, whether he or she is looking into ethical philosophy, one of the religious philosophies that belongs to one of the ancient traditions, or is more involved in therapeutic or new age spirituality, is entitled to find something. You know. Here, you know, you have a wide array of people from all over the world who are dedicating their time and energies to this dialogue. I want them to find something just as I want to find something. So my wish is to share my search with total frankness and total transparency, not to the point of morbidity, but I, I want to be <laughs> as, 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 as frank and transparent as I possibly can. Mm. Well, we love that about you. So let's talk about um, I think it's chapter one or chapter two in Daydream Believer, when you're talking about the power of a wish. And as we we all know, there's so much positive and new age thought out there that says that you have to, in order to create what you want in your life, that everything is attracted to how you're being. Therefore, think the thought and have the feeling of the thing you want to have. And the law is it will come to you well. So we we have some things about that to discuss. But there's a perspective you have that's unique in the field and one that I feel like I've held myself but never heard someone else share. And so I was like, okay, let's get into it. You mean we don't have to feel amazing in order to create something amazing? We can create it right out of the muck? Tell us about it. Yeah, um, this is a theme I explore really extensively in Daydream Believer and it grew out of a crisis in my own search. And this is something you and I have discussed both publicly and privately. I am fascinated with mind metaphysics and new thought, with the contention that thoughts are causative. And I think that we've seen enough, both in the sciences over the past 150 years or so, as well as millennia of testimony from individual seekers to give credence to that idea. Different people might give weight to it in greater or lesser ways. Some people might have a more metaphysical or extra physical viewpoint as I do. Some people might have a more psychological viewpoint, but I think everyone would agree that to some greater or lesser extent, thought is determinative of experience. And yet we are confronted every day with deeply intense emotions that do not necessarily cooperate with thought, even as we're told within the new thought tradition, a tradition of which I'm a part and which I care about very deeply, we're told you have to adopt the feeling state of the wish fulfilled. And there's precedent for this in Western scripture, there's precedent for this in Buddhism, there's precedent for this in various hallowed sources that can be pointed to. And this has become a kind of central tenet of mind power philosophy, that you have to work yourself into the feeling state of the wish fulfilled. And the feeling state itself serves to put it however you like, magnetize, manifest, I use the term select, I have my own particular reason for using that language. But there's a problem with it, which is, is of course, that our thoughts, our emotions, our bodies, they all run on different tracks. They all have their own demands. They all have their own needs. 
And if thought were alone were capable of running the show, then there would be no problem with addictions. There would be no problem with self-destructive behavior. Intellect alone would be enough to say, I mustn't do that. I mustn't consume this. I mustn't eat that. I mustn't lose my 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 temper, you know, again in a, in a situation that's predictable. But none of those things are possible within human nature or our psychologies and our ethical philosophies and our search would almost be unnecessary. The intellect could do it all. So I began to ask myself very, very seriously and to work with this idea. If I take seriously the notion that thoughts are causative, which I do, and I have a whole array of reasons for that, some of which you and I have discussed as part of this program. So if I take that seriously, but I also recognize the problem of thought shaping emotion, and maybe emotion doesn't always want to be shaped, you know? I mean, feelings of despair, feelings of grief, feelings of anger, these things all have a just pull on us. These things all have their due. Uh, I don't think that we human beings were built to be uniform in some way in terms of always returning to a, a home base of happiness and contentment. We're dynamic beings and life can be messy. Well, why shouldn't it be messy? You know? So I began to ask myself, is it really that the suffering individual needs to rearrange his or her thoughts to assume the feeling state of the wish fulfilled, assume the feeling state of contentment, or, or if the mind power thesis is correct, is it possible that the wish alone, the focused wish alone, is enough to set its energies in motion? And what I mean by, I mean, I'm speaking metaphorically, of course, but I do get into some real hardcore detail about what I mean by that in Daydream Believer and the Miracle Club. So, as I've said, before in our exchanges, I don't think that Mother Nature played a cruel trick on us. I don't think that Mother Nature, so to speak, said to the individual, well, you're suffering, you're in grief, you're experiencing addiction, you're experiencing despair, you're experiencing anxiety. Only when you can work yourself up into the emotional state where those feelings are not experienced can you receive relief. That to me seems like a kind of almost cruel circular logic to impose on the human situation. So if you take seriously the mind causation thesis, I encourage you uh, to work with, to experiment with the possibility that the focused wish by itself, deeply held to, well-defined, is in itself sufficient to set in motion these causative energies of the mind. That's what I've been working with. I'm trying to, I'm trying to arrive at a new thought that doesn't hem us into just one one doorway, one single doorway to unlocking the royal road to the subconscious. Yeah, and I feel like that's so important at this time as so many of us are challenged by so many things happening in the world, in, in our inner world and in, in the world at large. The It's sort of almost tyrannical to think that only good will come if you can generate a pure feeling of goodness. Mm -hmm. And as if that doesn't happen, there's almost like we're stuck in sort of a, I don't know, a punishment reward paradigm that's yes, just yes. so 5,000 year years old. I'm so done with whatever that punishment reward paradigm is. It's like, I think we're done with that now. And yet we need to make a leap into what's next. And part of what I love about, about your work and also what we do in intentional creativity. So intentional creativity, we work with a thought, which is energy, which becomes somatic translated into a creation, a dance or a painting or a piece of work, therefore becomes matter. Eyes register it, perceive it, has a sensation, comes back as energy and this circuit gets created. So there's an immediate movement from, well, not always immediate, but like there's a movement from energy to form, to energy, to form, to energy, to form. And we know that things are happening in, in the quantum world when those circuits are moving. So we talked to us a little bit about just this idea of the wish as sufficient to generate the energy to start something moving. Yeah, yeah. And I think specificity is really important. It doesn't have to be specificity to the point where you're, you're naming specifics down to the granular level. But I think it is really important as well that the individual be radically honest with him or herself. And sometimes that radical honesty, which I endorse practicing in private. You know, I, I take very seriously private contemplative practice. I don't feel that the individual has to or should, frankly, share everything because other people can detract from 
our resolve. And it happens all the time. You know, people who are supposed to be our friends make cruel jokes. People who we get s seated next to for Thanksgiving or Passover or whatever it is, you know, um, ask us questions that are really just kind of setups, you know, maybe to take shots at us. I'm not trying to be grim, but this is just human nature. We've all experienced it. There are very, very good reasons to maintain silence. So what I'm suggesting is that the individual practice radical self-honesty, both in terms of maybe a near-term goal or in terms of a life aim. I believe very, very strongly that having a really, really definite, clear, focused aim in life is just critically important. And it's, um, it's a bargain, I think, that life strikes with us. You know, I think that we live under, or we certainly experience, many, many laws and forces. There are many, many different forces at play in the l lives of different individuals. But I do think that you bring power to your efforts when you really, really focus your psyche. We see this in nature all the time, whether it be air or, or, or water or light photons. You know, these things can be waved out of the way unconsciously, and we do it all day long, but when they're intensely focused, they can bore through rock, quite literally. And I don't see why our psyches are an exception to the laws of nature. That's something that the transcendentalists wrote about quite a bit and that I've always taken to heart in my search. And we resist coming up with these, I mean, it's funny, one of the tricks that society plays on us is because we are possessed of such a therapeutic language, which I think is a good thing, and because we are encouraged in many quarters to be self-reflective, also a good thing, we sometimes make the mistake of thinking, I know what I want. I get it. <laughs> I read that chapter. I did those exercises. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good. I can check off that box. But I always, I implore people, I implore them, look again. Just look again. Because we internalize enormous amounts of peer pressure. And some of the stuff that we repeat within, that we tell ourselves that we want, I think is impacted by peer pressure in ways that we may not suspect. And I think we feel very driven to ask ourselves, uh, we feel very driven to sort of frame our desires in ways that we think are going to look good to other people or look good to what our, whatever our conception of the greater is, even if we're doing it within the exquisitely private confines of our own psyche. I suggest to the individual, just as an experiment, just throw that out, just for one evening, throw that out. This is a private experiment. I'm not saying you have to run out and act on everything that comes to you, <laughs> but really, really peel back the onion and ask yourself, what do I want without any inhibition whatsoever? It's so important. And one of the reasons why it's so tricky is because we think we do it all the time. Right. And I say that we don't. I say we internalize mm -hmm. so much peer pressure that we, we don't do it. And, you know, we also internalize things that get repeated to us across centuries. Whatever culture we live in, there are codes of life that have been so frequently repeated to us that we accept them as foundational truth. But right. are they foundational truth? The, the seeker, I think, has to verify. And these are all things that the individual could do in private. And I'm not saying you have to run out and act on every errant thought that occurs to you. <laughs> but just think of the incredible, incredible freedom that mm. you have within to ask yourself, how do I know that's true? What do I really want? What would I say if I don't care what my spouse or my boyfriend or my shrink or this person or that person thinks, you know, and, right. and at least know, at least know. And yeah. I, I, I think you'll come to someplace surprising. Yeah, it's, it's such an invitation because we are so mired in default thinking mm -hmm. that we're not even conscious that we're thinking it. And therefore, we can sometimes have a challenging time get, getting out from under those layers. And unless you come across teachers or situations or have a midlife awakening, just, you know, based on life experience, we sometimes aren't, aren't asked the question, like, what are those default settings and how are they creating your day-to-day -day life, your present and your past and your future? And yet I find it can also be extremely threatening and scary to actually confront 
that the entire paradigm that you were raised within, that you were living within, that you've been told is truth with a capital T may or may not be so, or may or may not be so for you. And so it's, um, you know, that's why we sometimes say this is kind of dangerous work because we are questioning and asking ourselves to go underneath that and see what's there. And what I hear Mitch suggesting is that underneath what's there, there may be a different desire than what we're conscious of. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's amazing how in, I, I, I mean, I can only speak for the world in which I live. There's people with us tonight that come from all over, but the world in which I live is a world that on its surface is filled with invitations to be your own person, seek out wherever you want. These are now advertising slogans. You know, we right. get sold this idea that you're an individual, be you, be yourself. And, you know, these whole ideas of be yourself, it all gets repeated to us so frequently that, <laughs> that um, I don't think we realize how frequently these questions of what we want get get taken away from us, not, not just by the consumer culture, uh, which is sort of an easy target. It's always easy to, you know, blame blame the advertisers, you know, it's, it's, it's heavier than that. You know, I, I mean, I think that we all go into peer groups, some of which, some of these peer groups might see themselves as being very heterodox, being very outside the fold, but orthodoxy, unfortunately, is, is human nature. We as human beings seem to like rules and we seem to like ideas of who's, who's obeying the rules and who's not obeying the rules. And, um, and when we're in a position of accusing somebody of not obeying the rules, it's kind of powerful and you know people enter peer groups of every kind and it's just human nature we all ask okay what are the goodies you know how do i get the goodies ah. into this particular group and that could be very reinforcing mm -hmm. of values that we might not really dig or it might not really be ours and then of course you have religious and ethical traditions that have been repeated for generations some of which might have very good ideas but at least let us examine them, let us explore them and not just assume those are foundational truth. Um, years ago, I was talking to a therapist, good guy, and I'm not at all criticizing him. And he asked me a question about something that I wanted and he said, yeah, but that's superficial. And I said to him, hey, listen, you've known me for years. Do you really think I'm handing you something that's superficial or could the thing that you're calling superficial be really meaningful in my life? So. I want to say to, to people, um, just as an experiment, you know, don't allow peer groups or advisors or guides or whatever to deter you, at least in the space of this experiment that I'm proposing, from seeking out what you think you may want and from really acknowledging that and being truthful about that. Mm -hmm. Because I think that stuff gets taken from us all the time because it gets mm -hmm. classified and people are made to feel shame maybe about seeking a solution that's outside their, their, their peer group. And I, I want people to be very relaxed about that in the profoundest sense and to realize that an answer could come and often does come from a place that's either very unexpected or that's so familiar perhaps that we're mm -hmm. apt to write it off, but don't, don't condition it. Don't condition yeah. it. Just, be acknowledging of what you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially in this idea of what if, what if for the next 24 hours, those of you who are listening would actually just do this experiment with us and really just spend this next 24 hours, um, get, getting a little bit underneath some of what you've thought about and not needing to change your state and just actually creating that inquiry into desire and maybe a wish you know, wish for me feels a little bit lighter than desire in a way. Like there's like you wish on a star, you wish over your birthday cake, you wish when you get the four leaf clover, it has like this different energy for me than just the desire. There's like a lightness to it. And so it feels like almost like there's a category of deeper desire and then there's longing. And then above that, there's like this wish energy. And it's like a permission slip to allow myself to wish for that. And I think we can be scared about it, you all, because when you, when you actually admit what you want, um, we're afraid because it's kind of out there now. 
And then there's that fear that we're going to want it more because we've acknowledged it. But like Mitch said, you don't need to share it with us or share it with anyone. Maybe just keep it into the sanctuary of your own heart. And maybe we'll report back if you're a museum member, um, share with us on our private iMusea app. Or if you're in the Red Thread Cafe classroom, share in there. Just experiment. Just set your clock and alarm and just be like, okay, for 24 hours, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wish on a star and see what happens. And then those of you who are uh, working on paintings or drawings or pottery that you could somehow bring a little bit of that energy into what you're working on. And Mitch, I was thinking about this, um, uh, the concept by David R. Hawkins about the map of consciousness. And it's interesting how there's like these, there's numbers assigned, you know, where anger is and where different things are. And then the, you finally get to a place of consciousness at like 200 and 200 is courage, but there's all the way to a thousand. And I was, I was judging it because I judge all hierarchies, even though it's cool. Right. I was like, okay, cool. But I was like thinking about this wish thing that we've been talking about. And I was thinking about how, um, grief is, is below, is below. And I was like, no, actually this is such a pure state or anger at injustice. Like that is such a pure state. Like that doesn't, that's not low, you know, that's, it's different. And so when we constantly move things in this hierarchical way, and even sometimes that as above, so below, there's like this up and down quality. And I'm like, what if we could spread out a little bit and mm -hmm. know that there's a spectrum within grief and there's a spectrum within anger and there's a spectrum. I've had incredible experiences in just in absolute despair. And if I thought I had to leave that in, in order to start a shift, then I feel like I'm ripping myself off from the depth of an experience. Yeah, yeah. I, it's so fascinating. You know, one of the things I, I explore in Daydream Believer and Miracle Club is this question, and I'm, I'm going to get very trippy for a second, and then I'll just- Trip out, I'll, do it. Okay. We're, you're in the right place for <laughs> tripping. <laughs> I mean, I'll put this in brief, but look, we know that linear time is an illusion. We know factually that time bends in circumstances of extreme gravity or extreme speed. It's an absolute fact. And I, I mean, dig this. Astronauts in our own era, even though they're not traveling at velocities anywhere near light speed, they do experience minutely reduced effects of aging. It's absolutely crazy and it's real. And that's just one of the many impossible possibilities that you start to deal with when you get into quantum theory, interpretations of quantum mechanics, string theory, Einstein's relativity theories. And the crazy thing is we've known some of this stuff for decades. I mean, since, since Einstein, literally, we've known for decades that time yeah. bends in conditions of extreme gravity. It doesn't make it feel any less real. And linear time is necessary. I mean, if Shiloh says, gee, we're going to start at 7 p.m. Eastern, I can't say, well, time's not real. You know, I mean, I have to be <laughs> here. We need time as a linear device to navigate experience. But it is a device, it is a concept, mm -hmm. it's not real ultimately, and we know this. Yeah. And so this is one of many, many things that could be explored in this vein. But the fact is, if we know this, and if we really dig this, this is why I think the power of a wish is so extraordinary. Because if you identify, I mean, if you accept the validity that you lead an extra physical existence, it starts to open up some remarkable possibilities. Even if you or I don't feel those possibilities at this given moment, I still think those possibilities are present, which is why I value a wish so deeply. Hmm. So, was, uh, oh, okay, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that following from that, it's entirely possible that when we have fantasies, for example, about what we would do if we could go back and give advice to a younger self, those things may actually be entirely possible because if time is not absolute in some linear sense, that may be possible. And it behooves the individual to, wow, well, I used to say, um, be careful, but can any of us really be careful? I mean, we don't <laughs> know all the different uh, unfoldments and that we have if the psyche is infinite. The thing that you or I experience as painful is also refining, is also refining. If I could remove episodes from my life, as I recall them, that were emotionally or painful, um, I'd be removing things that have, uh, helped assisted me to be a more mature being. 
Yeah. So it's a tricky it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing. You know, I don't want to see an individual suffer. I don't want to suffer. But grief as you were describing it may be an absolutely necessary refinement mm -hmm. without which the individual would be childish, you know. So mm -hmm. it's it's a interesting I, you know, and something, one last thing I wanted to say apropos of a wish. Another way that our wishes get taken from us, and, and forgive me, this is a bit tangential, but I'll be very brief about it. Another way that our wishes get taken from us is that in different religious traditions, we are told, like, well, you know, that's coming from ego, that's coming from personality. I'm not down with those definitions at this point in my search. Me too. I firmly believe from personal experience that the sensitive individual is capable of identifying what he or she needs in life. I really absolutely believe that. And I, I honor and I venerate many of the spiritual traditions and I have been told many stories and I've lived out some of these stories myself where somebody will approach a teacher from a spiritual tradition and say, I want this or I need that. And the teacher might say something to that person like, well, which I is speaking? Where is that coming from? And there may be wisdom in that. But I'm just speaking from this perspective, at this point in the road in my search, I firmly believe that the mature individual is capable of identifying his or her needs. And I feel that that's another way that our wishes or acknowledgement of our wishes get taken mm -hmm. from us. You're so many spiritual traditions, well-meaning or otherwise, <laughs> um, seek to put an intermediate veil between the individual and what they actually see, feel, and know. And this is something that we know about from, you know, the, the past times of, of witch burning and witch hunting. And also it's the, it's on the rise. Now we work with the United Nations on different projects and it's not something that's gone. It's just in a different phase of the story. And so when people have demonstrated um, knowing things that others do not know, or just things that others know, but they're willing to admit um, special awareness about stars, seasons, plants, uh, intuitions, any of the senses other than the five, um, we become um, watched and under scrutiny and subject to, you know, uh, removal sometimes from the culture. And I know growing up with a family of, of healers and creatives and astrologers and just pure eccentrics that they told me to, you know, cultivate my gifts, but mostly in private and don't share most of them and find a, find a way to live a life where you're not sacrificing them, but also just like, don't let everybody know what you know, because that could be dangerous in this right. culture, you know? And I feel like that isn't, it's different now, but it's not that different. I mean, most of the um, primarily women that I know who have an experience of having a special kind of knowing have really repressed that. And I know you've done some work with that in your own work regarding um, the occult and, and people who have special access to things. Do you want to speak about that a little bit? Because it seems connected to the individual knowing what they know without needing someone to tell them what they know. Absolutely. Um, I guess it's an extension. It's a direct extension of what, what uh, you know, we were just speaking of. I, I think people are so frequently told, including in therapeutic and religious traditions that are supposed to be encouraging of the individual that they can't know who they are. They can't know what they're about. You know, I remember once I was um, I was sitting in a, a meeting of an esoteric spiritual group and um, one of my friends in the group uh, asked some senior members, what about happiness? You know, what what is the role of happiness? And um, I remember feeling at the time that his question was somewhat disrespected as if it was almost mm -hmm. kid stuff, you know, that, mm -hmm. that the word happiness itself within this very deeply intellectual group was considered to be, oh, I don't know, sort of immature in a certain Frivolous. way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a sign that he was, he was, he was knocking on the wrong doorway. And I thought to myself, well, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, this may be an individual who grew up in an atmosphere of fear and despair, whatever it may be. And what's captured in his use of the word happiness may be something that's hugely important to this individual, hugely important yes. to this individual, which is why I'm really, really, I, I'm, I'm very resistant of classifying anybody's wants or 
wishes on some scale because how could I possibly know right. how meaningful this might be in the life of this individual? It, it could be just extraordinary. And I think that I guess the same holds true in terms of people who have had experiences that could be described as extra physical or unusual or something of that. I mean, imagine all the people um, over decades uh, in the military, for example, who might have had um, witnessed a, um, some kind of UFO phenomena and they thought, well, I'm not going to say anything about this because everybody's going to think I'm a nut and I'm going to lose my pension and terrible things are going to happen. Well. As it happens in our generation right now at this moment, we have more clear, more vivid, more empirical evidence of what are called UFOs, whatever they are, on high-res video, Navy cockpit videos, radar, than we've ever had at any time in, in, in history, modern or, or the entire stretch of, of human history. So the UFO question, for example, is alive at the moment in a way in mainstream life that it's never, never been before. But think of the people who in the 1950s, 1960s, we're told that they were nuts, they were delusional, they, you know, were drinking or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they told their commanding officer, you know, I think I saw something. And mm -hmm. yet now I can't really think of any intellectually serious person who dismisses the UFO question. We don't know what it right. is, right. but that it's a live question is almost universally felt. Well, right. that wasn't true when I was a kid. Right. And, and a lot of people suffered a lot of embarrassment for talking about that stuff. So yeah. that's just one example of how... Yes. You know, we, we put people into terrible boxes and now almost everyone acknowledges, well, this is a real serious deep question. Yeah, and the and the the cycles of life change. Like think of, you know, in the thirties and forties if you were going to therapy, you know, that was something was wrong with you. And now if you're not going to therapy, something's supposed to be wrong with you. I'm like, right, okay, exactly. paradigms change. <laughs> That's well put. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're gonna um, take a brief break and and come back and answer some questions from those of you who are gathered here. And what I wanted to invite those of you who are here to do is spend a little bit of time dreaming into this wish that you have and how it rises up within you and of a, a way to allow yourself to unburden the blinders and the parameters or even the veils around it. And to just acknowledge that sometimes there is, there can be some fear of bringing something forward that we've kept hidden consciously from ourselves, even intentionally. But this is what we're doing here, right? This is a part of intentional creativity. This is part of the conversation is we actually want to be a part of a community of people who are as conscious as their soul will allow them to be at any given time. And the people that we talk to and the processes that we do and the journeys that we go on and the spells that we break and the spells that we make are all a part of our community vision of that we each, we each get to, con you know, to curate our own consciousness, right? That we each get to do that. But there's some practice that sometimes happens when we haven't been doing that, when we didn't know. People didn't just tell us, yeah, you're in here, you're the storyteller, you get to tell the story, those are other people's story, you, you know. So it takes some time. So we'd like to just take a couple minutes and give you a, a chance to stretch, get a cup of tea, or do a little bit of journaling about your wish. And then you are welcome to put questions that you have for Mitt into the chat and he'll be checking those out. And we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. All right, everyone, just go ahead and take a moment to wrap it up. You know how much we love to make it real by putting it in writing. When you think it and then put it in writing and then read it and then be with it, you are multiplying form and I believe amplifying the field around yourself and how you're working. And as we amplify the field, it subtly starts to change, especially if we pay attention to how the field around our physical body and our energy and our th thoughts just starts to, you know, to me, it just starts to sprinkle a little bit. You just start, start to feel this um, something moving. And when you have, those of you who have had been in the depth of despair and, and suffering, a little bit of something moving is sometimes a good thing, right? Because when you're really in that place, it's one breath at a time. So we have some wonderful questions here. Um, Nancy says, 
Mitch talks about the shared experience of unremarkable people and referring to himself as one. I am curious, Mitch, if you think there are humans that are remarkable under this same definition. Mm. Well, I, I tend to think that no life, strictly speaking, is exceptional, which is why the experience of one individual, myself or somebody else, I think is valuable, which is why I think experience uh, forms a testimony. Uh, witnessing something, experiencing something, especially when you find a record of other people having the same experiences, I think it really does become a very, very important testimony. And my contention is that if you or I have a certain experience, our lives are not exceptional. Uh, uh, other people are bound to have had some experience like that. And that's what helps us navigate through life. There is, I think, a human universality. Our circumstances are radically different, but I think there is a human universality. And so I look for that. So, so I value you know, the general nature of life in that sense, because when one sensitive person has an experience, the likelihood is that, he, overwhelming likelihood is he or she is not alone. Yeah, I love that. I feel like my, my most challenging moments open my compassion, mm -hmm. especially when I can't get a hold of something. Like I'm really good at, uh, I mean, I like actually live in here. I am in my consciousness. I, ha I have arrived to the fullness that I am allowable to. And I still have these impossible moments and I'm like, oh gosh, this is how people feel when you just can't get a hold of it. So it's just like leaning into it. Well, Deborah Babcock has an amazing thing to say in response to your comment about the mature individual is capable of identifying their needs. And she adds, not only capable, but responsible to identify and name our own needs right, right? So if you would speak a little bit to that responsibility to identify and name our own needs. Well, it. I think that when people feel divorced from a sense of their own needs, I think a kind of despair can set in. I think that's when gross consumption, for example, whether it's a booze or drugs or media or being on my phone constantly, that's when gross consumption becomes a kind of salve because I, I haven't identified my needs. And of course, when the individual takes up this responsibility and identifies his or her needs, it may be, well, gee, I can't always act on this. And I would say, First of all, at the outset, I think it's I think it's still critical to identify your needs. Even if you feel you can't act on it or you can't act on it immediately, it's still so critical. What a tragedy it would be for the individual not to at least know, not to right. at least know. Let's right. say, for example, you're in proximity to somebody who's really bad for you, but maybe Maybe you have an economic dependency on that person. Maybe you have an employment dependency on that person. Maybe you feel the consequences of separating from that person would be too great. And that's understandable. But I would at least say to you, just deal with, acknowledge the reality that you really would like to get away from that person if somebody is draining your life from you in whatever way. Acknowledge that first and foremost to yourself. You, you owe that to yourself. You, you, you owe that to yourself to at least know it. And then at least acknowledge the consequences. They might be too great, you know, but maybe in five years they won't be, or maybe next week they won't be, or maybe the consequences aren't as great as you think. You know, I can't, I can't speak for another individual, but I, I have found that sometimes we have an exaggerated sense of consequence and getting away from a person or a circumstance is not as gravely consequential as we think. So that's, that's sort of a, um, a side note, but I, I, I think that yes, there is a responsibility and I, I think it will save you in ways that might not be immediately apparent if you at least get to that place of acknowledgement. Mm, and that makes me think of the quote by Rumi, this turning toward what you deeply love will save you. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Melissa. Mitch, how do you see the role of acts of nature or God in impacting the trajectory of someone's deeply held wish or desire? Well, it's an interesting question because one of the area, one of the ways, I guess, in which I break with traditional new thought is this notion that we live under one mental super law. We may, we may 
in some ultimate sense, live under a law of consciousness or of awareness? We very well may, and I, I'm very interested in that question. But in the sphere of existence that we occupy in the here and now, there are certain laws that must be abided. Mortality, for example, is, is one of those <laughs> laws. I mean, we're all going to experience mortality. It doesn't mean that's all there is, but it's coming. And, you know, I mean, that's the way things are. I don't like the expression that there are no accidents because in fact i do think there are accidents i am my, with you on that yeah in my, in my estimation of course there are accidents i mean if an individual lives in a country or a place that's on a a fault line or a landmass that's susceptible to earthquakes susceptible to tidal waves susceptible to monsoons or whatever it may be my god of course there are accidents you know yeah. i think it's a cruel expression in its so ultimate sense yeah and i think people experience things all the time and and nature has its own laws and and i've mentioned just one of them mortality mm -hmm. and we experience these laws uh, all the time and sometimes people are experiencing depression for example well mm -hmm. you know depression may be circumstantial depression may also be something that has a biologic component or it may be both and there are so many causes that run through an individual's lives so i i believe very deeply that we are co-creative beings, as above, so below, as the hermetic dictum goes, but we are co-creative beings who live in an extremely dynamic sphere of existence, and we have to experience different laws and forces. So let's say that the law of mentality, to, to just you know use a random way of framing it, is, is actual, is real, is legitimate. Well, a law, to be a law, must be consistent. You know, That's gravity right. is consistent, but we're going to experience it differently on different planets. Gravity is mass attracted to itself. It's affected by mass. Uh, water is consistently water, but it can be a solid, a uh, liquid, or a vapor, depending upon temperature. So there's all these different factors that intervene. And I do think we can learn a great deal about our psyches by looking at the patterns of nature, because I do believe, as above, so below, is a, a kind of a universal law of life, but within that universal law of life, I believe there are also enormous intervening factors. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. And for those of you who find yourself saying there are no accidents or everything happens for a reason, um, I mean, I, people must say that to me like two or three times a week <laughs> because we're acknowledging that something serendipitous happened. And I don't want to take that away, but what I want to suggest is that we could we could say, you know, for me in this moment, this feels totally aligned and serendipitous um, and remove the everything happens for a reason and remove the no accidents, like some things are. And so it's like this way that we're, we're working to become a little bit more rigorous with our language and how we're talking. I mean, how we're talking to other people, someone may have just experienced an extreme tragedy and you're like, it's, you know, it's all good. It's all, you know, so uh, here we're just inviting you to be conscious of that. So we have a couple of other uh, questions. So hold on a second here. And um, uh, Luna says, in this overshare culture, as a private person who practices the inner contemplative states, how would you suggest a balance between both worlds? That's a wonderful question. Um, one of the things that I personally do to maintain a balance is I am part of what is called a mastermind group. That's a concept from the work of Napoleon Hill, where he suggests that two or more people of like values can form into a group and meet at regular intervals and use that as an opportunity to harmoniously share their intimate wants, needs, desires, ask one another for help, advice, meditation, prayer, depending upon the nature of your group. And that becomes a space in which you're able to share things very, very freely. Now, that's a method that I use uh, that's very fruitful, meaningful to me. I have a group that I get together with by conference call every uh, Friday at noon Eastern time. The critical thing in that kind of a setting is that, and this is something directly from Hill's work that I believe in, there needs to be a real true chemistry and harmony of values and, and mm. a, a real sense of like-minded 
selfhood, purpose, a unity, a harmoniousness. Mm -hmm. And that's a mastermind group, in short. Yeah. And, um, but I don't respond well to the congregational model. And um, a lot of the spiritual work that I do, and if someone does respond well to the congregational model, I say, bravo, that's positive for a lot of people. For me, the work I do is more contemplative and private. And I, I encourage privacy because I, I do think there's a certain strength in holding things very, very closely and very, very carefully because people bark their opinions at you, sometimes in subtle ways, sometimes family members, sometimes our so-called friends, may we be rescued from our friends. <laughs> and and, it, and it, takes our, it takes our energy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't mean that just quite metaphorically. So yeah. I think that sometimes through finding an intimate group, mine is a mastermind group, one can have that balance between mm -hmm. privacy and intimacy. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. We have uh, one more question that we have time for here, which is from Angel and Keen. We know you have kids and you're wondering how they resonate with your orientation to life. Are they inspired or do they push back like most kids? I want to ask the same question, including your parents. Like, what are they thinking about what you're up to, Mitch? <laughs> oh, well, I was raised in a traditional Jewish household. I had an Orthodox uh, bar mitzvah, actually, in the borough of Queens in New York City when I was 13 years old. <laughs> <laughs> a journalist asked me recently, did your family sort of react against your, your, your spiritual directions? And I said, you know, it was, it was gradual. It was gradual. So I think it, 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 it all took shape, you know, over the course of years. It wasn't just one radical break. Um, what do my kids think? You know, it's, it's, it's so funny. I, I think if I come at them directly with ideas, they will reject those ideas. But indirectly, indirectly, I will hear them and pick up on them referencing things that you know may have run through a discussion or something like that. One of the lessons that I will never learn, uh, but that I'm <laughs> cognizant of, is that everything must be indirect with kids. Everything must be indirect with kids. And one of the things I've tried to do at this point in my life, um, my older son is 17 and my younger son is 15, I think that more important than anything I say is how I say it. And I have, I have, I'm astonished, you know, that I didn't realize this at an earlier point in parenting. I think I realized it intellectually, but I didn't recognize it emotionally. Now I recognize it emotionally that how something is said is just everything, you know, with kids. So I tried to model a way of being, a way of talking, a way of engaging that I think is positive because that's infinitely more important than any principle, you know, that I would offer. Mm. Thank you so much for that. I know we have more questions and that people are excited. It takes a while sometimes for people to uh, start percolating, right. And tuning in and feeling into the group. So I just want to honor your questions and invite you to um, bring it, bring it back to your journal, bring it back to your painting and, there's lots of ways we can continue to interact with uh, Mitch's teachings. And Mitch, we're just so grateful to have you with us today to start off season three of Muse and Maverick. <laughs> and uh, grateful for your exploration. And I think I just want to say too, as someone who has stood so almost rigidly against New Age and a lot of new thought, but really wanting to create an empowering, beautiful, encouraging environment. I really struggled to find a way to do that without buying into a lot of that pre-existing behavior, which ended up, um, I do a lot of cleanup work from people who have been in those fields coming here. And then they just end up feeling ashamed that they couldn't create the life. They can't believe they got here. So we do a lot of cleanup on aisle five of the past, right? Um, so I'm grateful that you are not you know, that you're, you're choosing to stay in it on one hand, on the other hand, you're choosing to expand it because sometimes you talk about that it, um, it just needed the next evolution and it hadn't actually gone there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I appreciate that enormously. I think these philosophies have done a better job of popularizing themselves than of refining themselves. And sometimes when you're really popular, you think, Hey, I'm doing things right. And <laughs> right. Pop popularity is not everything. <laughs> my mom used to say it's probably totally politically incorrect but my mom used to say if they're not throwing rocks at you you ain't moving baby so keep going don't yeah. take it as a sign to turn back so i was raised to believe that if i'm gaining momentum and then i'm stopped in something that's a sign instead of the other way around it's like exactly the opposite of what we're taught about turning back so 
Yes. Well, gosh, Mitch, thank you so much. And thank you everyone so much for being here. We're so grateful to have you and we're going to pause for a moment. And I would love, um, we've put a whole bunch of different links for Mitch in the chat, but Mitch, if you want to just share for a moment here, um, if people want to be connected with you and study more of your work, what would you recommend? Well, my website is MitchHorowitz.com. Uh, I'm on social media and I'm, I'm on Twitter at Mitch Horowitz, on Instagram at Mitch Horowitz 23. Um, I have three new books out this year. One is called Cosmic <laughs> Habit Force, one is called Daydream Believer, and one is called Uncertain Places. And you can find all of them and others up on Amazon and elsewhere. Mm, thank you so much. And yeah, some upcoming Pleasure. courses. And yep. just remember, you know, with, with all of us, you all, uh, we are not endorsing that you think what we're thinking. In fact, we're provoking you actually to do your own thinking because we have done our own thinking and those who do their own thinking can provoke other people to do their own thinking. So we're not asking you to take on what I think or what Mitch thinks, but use this rich fertile material to stir up your own compost a bit and to really get into what it is to think your own thoughts, to examine and have your own contemplative practice, to get underneath some of those default settings and see what wish or desire is waiting to be spoken. So thank you everyone so much for being here. You'll hear more from uh, Mitch and myself in the future. And thank you again, Mitch, and many blessings with uh, the, the, the incredible work that you're doing. Thank you. Keep it up and thank we'll you. be uh, paying attention as Daydream Believer unfolds. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. Everyone. Pleasure to be here.